Thank you very much for having me here. This is truly an outstanding pleasure to be invited to give this talk to you today. Um, so I don't know if this is, I'm a little nervous, I don't know if this is going to be the talk you necessarily want to hear, but it is a talk I think you need to hear. And so um, I'm going to give it. And, and I do because I think ours is a particularly unique circumstance right now. I also think it's also time that we speak very candidly about the current gaps in graduate and postgraduate education that we're facing and genuinely discuss the realities of our academic training and where it falls short regarding career progression. Now, what I'm hoping to give you here is a completely different perspective from that that you've heard uh, probably in lectures such as these in the past. And while what I'm going to say needs to be said, it may not necessarily be easy to bear. So I don't want to pretend to tell you how to feel or what to do. What I'm going to tell you is how I feel and what I have done. And I'm hoping some of what I say might strike a chord with you and possibly resonate. But to discuss the elephant in the room, I think for starters, you need to know that 86% of you will not hold tenure track faculty positions. Now this is what your career pipeline actually looks like with most of you entering a period of postdoctoral training before pursuing um, research focused career paths or maybe leaving basic research outright. Now what is shown here is a career, a career trajectory plot and I think it's imperative that we remove all value judgments from these figures right now because this cannot possibly constitute failure. In fact, I think quite the opposite is true. And what I hope I can make clear to you is that there's a very strong case to be made for why remaining on the academic career trajectory might be the mistake. It's also important to emphasize that career prospects in academia are not going to improve anytime soon. And the reason so few of you will become tenure track faculty is because of this. Despite it being the only career path most of us receive any sort of formal training in. Now this is a shocking graph and perhaps what's most shocking about it is that it's true. And still, statistically, 72% of you expect to be principal investigators in academia and 92% of you expect to pursue a research-focused career path. Now, I want to be crystal clear here. There is nothing wrong with choosing a career in academia. But choice belays options, and I don't believe those truly exist here. From day one, academic scientists are taught to be academic professors by mentors who have only ever known that one career trajectory. Academic departments don't wholly acknowledge that there are insufficient faculty slots to absorb their own tra trainees, and ironically have provided little training historically to support the, the major career trajectories pursued by the majority of their students, despite theirs being a primarily educational mission. So it's not surprising that 72% of you want to be university professors, but, and I can speak from absolute experience here, what ensues is the illusion of free and informed choice with what I think are predictably crushing awakenings. Now without an, a legitimate offer in hand from another employer, you're not so much choosing a career in science as only being presented that one option. And your decision to pursue it blindly, however noble, may end up doing you more harm than good. So it's not a question of whether, or of if you're gonna go on to do something uh, better with your skill set in education, it's um, when. And to be perfectly frank, I believe there are better jobs out there. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now some of you can and do need to be university professors, but I think most of you can be so much more. So who am I? <laughs> I, I think that's a, a perfectly legitimate and fair question. I actually think John Lennon had the right of it. Uh, I'm an instructor at Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. 
I received my PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of British Columbia in Canada, where I work closely with Canadian Blood Services for the improvement of blood platelet processing and storage. I then continued my research as a postdoctoral fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where I studied platelet production under Joseph Italiano, which some of you might know in this room. And there, I won a K99R00 uh, research grant, which prompted my promotion to instructor at Harvard. And now my research focuses, as Anna Kira mentioned, on developing biomimetic platforms to generate functional human platelets and uh, address targeted new therapies for thrombocytopenia. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the other stuff that I've done. Because during the same time, I also co-founded Factual Footage Incorporated, which is a science consultancy firm for the film and television industries with the aim of ensuring scientific authenticity in the arts. Criterion Biosciences, an online resource for biotech investors, where I manage a scientific advisory board and I oversee operations of our firm's scientific review process, and most recently, Platelet Biogenesis, which is a biotech company with the goal of producing functional human platelets for human infusion, which I actually started with my postdoctoral mentor. Now, throughout this time, I have also been an active political blogger, writing for the University Affairs um, Journal, which is a Canadian journal that specializes on early career uh, issues for young scientists. The, the, the blog series is called The Black Hole, and if you haven't heard of it already, I strongly suggest you to check out this link and, and visit the site. Uh, I maintain this blog with Dr. David Kent, also a Canadian, on your side of the pond. He's at the University of Cambridge, and we post weekly. Now, Dave and I have very different perspectives on career transition and uh, education, but both of us are biomedical research scientists. Both of us uh, have gone through the same sort of academic training and career trajectory, and we're writing these articles with clear Canadian, American, and European focuses, which I think are particularly suited to this audience. So getting back to the question at hand, I am you. We share an education, training, and early career tra trajectory probably a lot of interest as well. I was remarking earlier that I have a soft spot for scotches uh, and I brew my own beer at home. But I'm also a serial entrepreneur. And I think my experience in this space, as well as my exposure to science policy as it affects early career scientists, is worth recounting and is why I'm here. Now lastly, I'm a firm believer in social enterprise and I truly um, ascribe passionately to the idea that if our singular goal is to improve human health and well-being through discovery, we do so better together by elevating one another than holding each other back. And that's why I was so enthused to accept the invitation to come and speak to you today. Now I've chosen to break my talk up into three themes and I'm going to try my best to stick with them. Those are creating options, defining roles, and the last one is titled The Public Scientist. And I very much want this to be an interactive talk as well. So I intentionally kept my talk short to foster discussion. I really do encourage you to ask me questions along the way. And what's important is that we begin that conversation here and that you progress the conversation through your long and uh, incredible careers that you've got ahead of you. So I don't want to be the only voice in the room. So let's talk about creating options, because I think this is um, uh, particularly important for you. And options are important because, and this is, again, speaking from experience, even if you have a stellar CV, a supportive, connected mentor, a long history of grantsmanship and current funding, there still not, may not be a faculty position available for you when you're ready to leave. Now, it, it was hard for me to come by stats here, but for the five faculty interviews I've been on, there have been at least 250 applicants per uh, faculty position. 
And each one of them has been as intelligent, committed, and driven as myself. And every one of them deserving of that faculty slot. Now, most biomedical departments, if they are hiring, which is both infrequent and increasingly sporadic, as some of the older faculty tend to stay at their posts for longer these days, will open up one, maybe two faculty slots. And once those are filled, they're probably not going to consider future candidates for another five plus years. And that's a very narrow window for you. And the fit might just not be there. The cold hard truth is that life goes on. And it'll go on with or without you. Now, alternatively, and I have seen a lot of this recently, after making it through the selection process and into your second and maybe third uh, interviews, you will and most likely uh, come to realize that the department might not be able to offer you everything you need to be successful. And that they do very much expect you to make up the difference yourself. Now, an over-reliance on external support to maintain your lab while expected to some degree can be a little bit dangerous in this particular funding climate that we're in. And it still may not be enough to see you through. So what do you do then? Do you turn down the offer knowing that it might be your only way out of a postdoc? Or do you accept the offer with the knowledge that if the funding runs out, you may be forced to leave that position in about three years time? Now, I, I actually don't have the answer for you. I don't know. Uh, but what I do want you to consider is that none of this is happening in a vacuum either. And stay with me, because this part's about to get a little bit dark. But at this stage, most of us are also in our early 30s. We're married or we've got a longtime partner. And we're increasingly wanting to settle down, improve our standard, standard of living, and possibly even start a family. Now, none of this seems possible, or at least seemed possible to me, on a $40,000 a year sal salary, no stability or any sort of um, job security, and, of course, the student debt. Now, the lack of career advancement, this uncertainty of employment, and the transitory nature of your last 10 years do begin to take their psychological toll. And this does eventually happen to all of us. Now, what happened to me um, is that crushing despair does give rise to strong feelings of abandonment, uh, delusionment, and eventually a lack of self-worth. And what I truly believe is that you don't need to be told that everything's going to work itself out, as I've heard so many times before. What you need are concrete options. And those are what I'd like to present you here. Now, in graduate school and through a postdoc, we're taught falsely, mind you, that there are only ever two options for us, academia or industry. Now, why there should only be two options is well beyond me. It doesn't make any sense. A few of us ever consider a third or fourth or fifth option, despite the fact that most of us end up in careers that are third, fourth, and fifth options. We're also taught that in academia, once you choose to leave, there's no going back, and that's very much a one-way track. And that's also absolutely false. Now, for starters, I think a very proximal option and arguably one of the more intelligent ones for those of us wanting to become academic faculty is medicine. There is a dire need for physicians with a strong grasp of the literature, strong uh, logical reasoning skills, and critical problem solving that gets taught very well at the graduate school level. Medical school and residency combined are actually not that much longer than a postdoc and an instructorship and your subsequent employment is pretty much guaranteed. This career path offers the best possible job security going and a significantly better salary. More so, despite our conceived knowledge of academic tracks being one way, if you leave it to enter medicine, following residency, you can go back and become a, a researcher and do the exact same job you would have done otherwise. Or you can choose to dedicate yourself to seeing patients if it turns out you like doing that more. And when grants dry up, as they inevitably will, you can take a greater patient load to make up the difference in your salary 
and you'll rarely have to worry about shutting down your lab entirely. Now, I can speak to this from experience as well, because my wife made this decision early on. She, right after she finished her um, degree in biological chemistry, her PhD in biological chemistry with me. That was five years ago. And the decision itself to leave the academic track to enter medicine was uh, very difficult for her, but, but psychologically difficult, difficult to come to terms with the fact that she was leaving something that she was told she shouldn't. That required a lot of support for both myself and family and friends. But once she made that jump, medical school actually was not all that challenging for her. And the fallout of that was that she ended up with a career she very much loves. And she's the happiest I've ever seen her in my life. So there, there are silver linings. Now, and this, this one is one I, I'm going to speak to uh, quite a bit because it's the one I have the most experience with. And that is entrepreneurship. And I bring it up because if academia is meant to represent intellectual freedom and independence, and uh, industry is meant to represent job security and earning potential, then entrepreneurship is really the best of both worlds. In a biotech startup, what you're doing is taking your own ideas and framing them within a context of an applicable product. And I truly believe that there is nothing more translational than this. This is the epitome of bench to bedside. Now, taking money from a private entity is actually not at all different from taking money from the federal government or from a not-for-profit organization. And in fact, as a private company, you still need to do that to get yourself going. As for your um, private investors, be they angel investors, biotech or pharmaceutical companies, or venture capitalists. And for those of you that don't know the difference, I'm happy to explain that to you at the end of the talk or um, afterward in private. Uh, as for receiving money from them, they'll often give you significantly more money than you would get from a federal source. With the added caveat, of course, that the private investor expects all of their financing to go into product development, and they're expecting to see returns on investment within five years on average. Now, federal and not-for-profit organizations, on the other hand, are theoretically more tolerant of exploratory science with no concrete timeline. But, and I think you can probably agree with me here, given the present funding climate, they're not any less concerned with clear and timely deliverables and expect those deliverables over the five-year grant cycle. So at the end of the day, it doesn't end up being all that much different. Moreover, if you're an academic in, an, in a university or hospital lab and you're receiving funding from an outside source, you can expect that funding to be taxed often heavily at the institutional overhead rate and then increasingly be, being forced to dilute that money across multiple different projects in order to uh, get your work up to a level where you could apply for more funding. Now, my colleagues like to call that um, money laundering. And to be honest, that's not too far a description from what you're doing. But what it means also is that progress on any individual project is going to move a whole lot slower than it could have if you were expending all of your resources to seeing that one aim through. Now, besides constituting another major source of research funding, the process of taking money, uh, sorry, the, the process of taking a research project private also exposes you, the principal investigator, to career trajectories that are far outside the narrow focus of university professor. Now, some examples, and these are all viable career options, include intellectual property law, venture capital, management strategy consulting, and research contract organizations if you like to do bench work, which I haven't listed here, you'll see for lack of space. Medium politics also overlap heavily with your entrepreneurial efforts. And uh, I'll be talking those, about those in a little bit, but within those realms as well, you've got company or industry analyst, regulatory consultancy, and of course, policy. 
Now, I mention all of these under the subheading entrepreneurship because as an entrepreneur, you'll be interacting very closely with <laughs> individuals from each one of these respective careers. And you'll have to, as you take on the role of chief executive officer, chief uh, scientific officer, and most likely chief operations officer as well as you try to get your startup off the ground. But I think regardless of whether your company is successful or not, the most important thing about trying is that the contacts you make along the way will open doors to career trajectories that most scientists have no idea even exist, but which I can guarantee you that you at this stage right now are ideally suited for. And I say that because not only are you presently at your most productive and committed, but the seemingly insurmountable odds, repeated failure, and the long horizons which your colleagues coming out of MBA programs are not well equipped to deal with are things that most of you have necessarily become extremely comfortable with, particularly in the sciences. I, I like to brag in my lab that if we see a 99% failure rate, we're doing pretty good. So that, that puts things into context for you. Now your current job, also be it graduate student or postdoc, while temporary, is actually stable enough over the two to three years that most uh, research training grants offer you and sufficiently flexible to let you take business classes if you want to take business classes, which to be honest, I don't think you need. You can also take, um, attend lectures or topic seminars, which I actually do think you should do to bring yourself up to speed on terminology and the way certain problems are thought about in the business world and do the ne necessary legwork you would need to do to see a new venture through, which you will absolutely need to do in order to, to be successful. And I can tell you also with certainty that VCs and angel investors do love to invest in PhDs, and I'm sure that you're at no shortage of ideas. Now, one major shortfall of academic training that I think is worth discussing is that graduate studies and postdoctoral studies uh, or postdoctoral fellowships do, don't teach their students the value and recognition of the skill sets they develop during their training. And those skill sets are actually paramount. They're, they're quite significant. But those skill sets, nevertheless, whether you know you have them or not, I can guarantee you are there. And they're all entirely applicable to business. For example, grant applications are business plans. It's the same thing. Seminars, like the ones you're going to today, are business pitches. Same thing. And the competencies you develop managing personnel, that is co-op students, summer students, technicians, your coworkers, even your own mentors, the skill set you develop accommodating budgetary requirements such as your own salaries, grant applications, laboratory operating costs, consumables and travel, and establishing and negotiating collaborations, as well as even meeting deadlines, are all directly uh, transferable to the boardroom. Now, as important as innovation is, I think great ideas are nothing without a strong scaffold in which to take root and grow. And collaboration is actually something that graduate programs do a very good job of teaching. And I think recognition of this is important because even if you don't have an immediately transferable technology in development, you can and absolutely should seek out um, colleagues from different laboratories with emerging technologies and lend your time to help see those through. Now I know you know what those technologies are because you're here at this conference listening to them. And I think there's an exceptional platform to be leveraged not just by those of us in training, but those of us established as well. Because taking a technology or research project and moving it into the private setting 
is more than a full-time job. And certainly if you're planning to remain an academic uh, <coughs> member, so that, that is a faculty member, or you want to remain within an academic institution, you can't do that job by yourself. So what you need to do is recruit someone to take your idea and run with it and move it into the private sector, meet with investors, develop the business plan around it, make the logistics work. And trainees represent a, a major source of value in that respect because they're young, ambitious, and essentially you're giving them the platform to then create careers for themselves. So it does end up being a win-win situation. Now, I, I do pitch this, and it sounds like this crazy idea that maybe it can work if uh, the stars align. But I can tell you with certainty that very many successful university professors have followed this model and spun off some incredibly profitable companies that are run by their graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. And I think an excellent example of this is Bob Langer at MIT, which I hope you'll know of, but if you don't, certainly look him up. Now, th this is a man who's uh, started, I don't know, it's maybe, maybe 12 different companies, each one of them run by students in his own lab. And I don't bring him up as an example uh, of ex excellent entrepreneurship, although it is, <laughs> but there are many people like him. The, the reason I actually bring him up is because he very recently published this uh, manuscript in Nature Biotechnology describing his process and his experiences starting his first couple of companies. And I would certainly check it out for those of you that are interested in pursuing career paths such as this because it does give you a little bit of insight into what's required. And he obviously sits on the successful end of the spectrum. Uh, I'm far earlier in the just getting going stage, but I'm, I should also be an, a resource for you, and if you do have questions, I encourage you to ask me. Uh, if not at the end of this talk, then just find me in private and we can discuss it because there are a lot of uh, bridges you have to cross and walls you have to scale, and I'm going through that process right now, so I can tell you a little bit about, about what that's like. So that takes care of medicine, entrepreneurship, law, capital, and management. But still another very lucrative option is media. Science communication is of major importance, and it also opens up the door to politics, which I would argue is a society we desperately need scientists to transition into. Both of my early companies operate in this space, the first providing scientific consulting for film and television, and the second uh, arming potential investors with critical insights into the pipelines of biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies that they're choosing to invest in. And even my blog, which I maintain for the purposes of social enterprise, does draw a salary. And there are examples on the University Affairs website of university professors who have actually left their tenure track uh, university position to become professional bloggers when they realized that the blogs that they were maintaining were actually resulting in a higher income than they were getting from their university appointment. Now there is, of course, journalist, editor, television, radio, podcasts, and advertising that you should be considering as well in this space. And I think you'll laugh, but uh, a colleague of mine who I did my PhD with, he had the, the lab right across the hall. He was being paid a six-figure salary to come up with new drug names, you know those three-syllable names, four-syllable names, come up with those names and uh, design the branding for these new pharmaceutical products, which for, apparently they exclusively hire research scientists for. I mean, that's, that's a job that exists and it's there. Now, I also want to mention that uh, members of parliament do very well. And I would argue that you're in a position to affect even greater change through politics than you will through your academic uh, career. And there is, of course, no reason why a prime minister shouldn't be on that list as well. 
Now, science is increasingly becoming integrated into our social fabric, and I deeply believe that experts are needed at all of these levels to transform the potential of new perspectives, approaches, and discoveries into what will become true social gains. Which actually brings me quite nicely to my second theme, which is defining those rules. And one thing that has always surprised me is that scientists, as a general rule, appear to be extremely content resigning themselves to generating ideas, publishing the landmark paper to validate that technology, and then leveraging that technology to ask for a little, bit, for a little amount of money, then lathering, rinsing, and repeating. Business, by comparison, has resigned itself to seeking out great ideas from you, mind you, turning them into a practical product, and then leveraging that product to generate significantly more money. And they do the same thing, lather, rinse, and repeat. But my question is, if the skill set is the same, then why would you stop here? Especially when the income that you're generating at the tail end of that pipeline could be fed back to support your research program. Now again, this sounds like a crazy idea, but you need to know that universities do this right now by taking ownership of your intellectual product and then uh, selling it to third-party companies to develop it for a profit. That's how universities operate in part. The question is, why shouldn't you reclaim your intellectual property and do the exact same? And if that's something you're interested, I could tell you about my experiences going through that process, licensing back the intellectual property from the hospital in order to be able to take an idea and run with it. Besides, I think, who better to develop the technology and apply it than the very scientists who developed it? And this doesn't only or shouldn't only pertain to profit, but value as a whole. Because what good are scientific advancements that no one hears about? And I think a particular prevalent question being asked right now is, why should a society continue to support science that they cannot relate to or understand? And while short, that's a an excellent bridge to my third and final point, which is this idea of the public scientist. And I bring it up because I think there's a lot that can be said on the public scientist or the public intellectual, as it's more broadly uh, referred to. Now, I'm of the opinion that if we believe ours to be a social, func a social function, that is to improve human health uh, and knowledge through discovery, then our education and training requires that we share our, our informed perspective with others. You know, the fact that most of us are supported almost exclusively by federal tax dollars demands it. I think we are very much in a prestigious position here, elevated by our peers and given the freedom to pursue rigorous academic training through publicly subsidized graduate and postgraduate programs uh, and publicly funded fellowships so that we can then use that knowledge and subsequently elevate our peers. Now this is, in my opinion, the primary role of academia. And if that's true, then who better to comment on issues relating to, relating to science, policy, and education publicly than us? And I truly believe that this is where we drop the ball. For some reason, the professionalization of academia and the increased specialization of the research scientist has led us to exclusively reward those scientists that tailor their work entirely to others in their field for professional advancement rather than to the audiences beyond it. Now, we're still, I think, is the assumption that given that specialist training, 
neither one of us is particularly qualified to speak to, to speak with any great authority on uh, issues or topics outside of the narrow focus of our research specialty. And also, I think that academic subculture has, as a result, connected and falsely, I think, the assumption that communication with non-specialist audiences is considered dumbing down one's message and has somehow, as a result, taken this conflated view or conflated negative attitude of the public intellectual in mock referral to their own self-perceived importance. Now, nothing could be further from the truth, and I think the fallout from that has been disastrous. I think a good way to put it is the way it was put by Stephen, uh, Stephen Gould recently when he said, what a strange set of historical circumstances, what odd disconnect between science and society can explain the paradox of organic evolution. The central operating uh, concept of an entire discipline remains such a focus of controversy and even widespread <laughs> disbelief in contemporary America. And this isn't just one man's thoughts. A 2012 Gallup poll in the United States shows that a whopping 46% of Americans still believe in creationism, a percentage that has all but remained constant in the last 30 years despite the huge advances we've made in, uh, in biology and, and chemistry and, and pretty much every walk of science based on that single tenet we know to be true. Now also uh, in the United States, this one touching a little bit closer to home, are the indiscriminate cuts in basic research funding in the form of nearly $1.6 billion that have resulted in funding rates in America of about 15%, which are significantly jeopardizing that country's role uh, and future in biomedical science and is legitimately putting an entire generation of young scientists out of work. Now, 15% is not all that much worse than what we're seeing in Canada and what you're seeing in the United Kingdom, Ireland, and really the EU. And of course, I think we need to consider the ridiculous ongoing controversy over climate change, whether it's real or not, and whether humans are the cause. And while some of these examples are a little bit more American biased, as a Canadian, I can tell you that Canada is actually not faring all that much better. In fact, uh, in my recent memory, I can't recall of a single minister of state that we've had as a country that has had a significant uh, graduate degree in science. And I think there are very few politicians in the world with, um, with a strong science qualification. Now, it's my opinion that if the bar is to distinguish true expertise from public belief and represent the scientifically informed opinion on the subject, then I warrant that bar should be set just above the average person's understanding of the topic. And considering that more than 99% of the world's population does not hold a PhD, let alone a PhD in science, that puts you firmly in that 1%. Now, you know as well as I do that we don't formally elect public intellectuals from our ranks. And I guess I can ask, since when has academia ever been free of uh, self-promotion? But the important matter is, to, is the fact that it's precisely you who I think the world is looking to, to translate basic research and comment on science policy. And I'm hoping, if you haven't heard that call already, that you'll take this to be your formal invitation. Because without you, this increasing body of knowledge, the scientific frontier that we struggle to keep up with, which is why we're here in the first place, I mean here at this conference in the first place, just to not be left behind, is all but inaccessible to the people who are paying for it, and especially to the world who can't afford to. Now, I may have entertained objections to this idea pre-Facebook tweets, 
um, Wikipedia and Google Plus Ones, but certainly not post. Because I think it's in this age of social and uh, media interconnectedness that each one of us has that duty to assume the role of public intellectual. And as in science, each new voice helps direct the choir and bring us into harmony. So in conclusion, I should probably repeat, I'm not actually trying to talk anyone out of a career in academia. Academics are needed. But the question to you is why would you stop there? I think you enter, once you've entertained some of these options and after you've created for yourself concrete options that offer you a higher salary, greater job security, a better standard of living, and the ability to make a more immediate difference in this world. Then you can choose how you practice science, confident in the knowledge that if you ever uh, are unhappy with the decision that you've made, the sheer amount of overlap between these professions means that you could always switch tracks because the world is very much your oyster. Thank you.